Right, so uh, welcome to Environmental Toxicology. This is, uh, I think, the fourth or fifth class that I've held at IPAC EDU, uh, but this is the first time I'm teaching this class, and I wanted to go through at the beginning of this before I start on it uh, to, you know, talk a, a little bit about why I decided in the middle of a pandemic with a virus circulating to teach this class. Well, the decision to teach this class actually was made before uh, COVID-19. I decided to teach this class after writing my book, the environmental and genetic causes of autism. I didn't know where I was gonna teach the class or how I was gonna teach the class, um, but I learned a lot about the env environmental toxins that are associated with autism. So this was this is a longstanding project and I'm really excited to share some of what I learned doing that project. Before I get started in the actual first lecture and opening of the, of the class, I wanna share with you some of the resources that I've accessed. So every, every week before the class, I will send to you a collection of readings. Of course, you're not expected to read all of them, but over the, the week after hearing the lecture, you know, or before the lecture, if I'm on, on, on the game and I can get it to you, look at those, look at the resources because they're, very, they're hand selected by me. They're valuable resources so that you know what you have. Now they're not very well organized at this point in time, and I'm more than happy to have a student that wants to organize this bibliography of the class for me. If anybody would want to do that as a volunteer, I'd be more than happy to, to have the help. Um, but I do wanna go through some of the resources here that, I, that I've referenced as reference material for this. Most of them I'm gonna show you, well, all of what I'm gonna show you are books, but in addition to the, the primary literature, um, uh, some of the books that I that I recommend, oftentimes students like to, to know is there something that they can read. This is a good one by Philip Landrigan and, and Mary Landrigan. Um, they, the children's and uh, children and environmental toxins, what everyone needs to know. Um, obviously, that's going to be in, involving the effects of tox environmental toxins on on neurological development. Um, in terms of environmental toxicology, uh, kind of one of the simpler ones. What I did reference is you can just get these used anywhere, an environmental science book. There's plenty of environmental science books out there from academia used. This one's by Richard Wright. It, it's okay. I mean, it gives a good broad, you know, introduction. This is a maybe 200 level college course uh, book. Um, and then an introduction to, let's see, the next one I'll show you. Introduction to Environmental Toxicology by DeMello. That was pretty good. Uh, it, it's got a lot of good reference material. Most of these books are older. There hasn't been a new one in a while. The, and the one that's coming out I'm really excited about is by Bruce Lanfear. He's working on that right now. This is written in an essay form. So this is not just packed filled with things that you, know, that, that you need to know if you're gonna be an environmental toxicologist. I like this a lot. So the, these, these chapters read like articles, like, 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 like blog articles. Um, Essentials of Environmental Health by Richard Frills is uh, Fries. Sorry, Fries is is the name. Uh, this again is about you know maybe a college level or even high school level, I think, uh, a book that ha has uh, decent some decent reference material. It, this goes. This is going to go on for a while. Um, the Human Impact on the Natural Environment uh, by Andrew Goody. I mean, one of the big foci that I have in this class is not just how do environmental toxins affect us, but how do environmental toxins affect animals and plants and microbes and the, and, and the mycorrhizae and the fungi. Uh, this is a, a, an essential book if you're interested in, in understanding the impact of environmental toxins uh, on, on the wilderness and on our environment. And um, this is a very, very, very good technical book on the biological and health effects of pollutants on humans. I mean, this is quantitative environmental toxicology, this one here. It's by um, Ming-Ho Yu, Fumio uh, Tsunoda, and Masashi Tsunoda. This is an incredibly good technical reference if you need to know how to calculate some of the curves that we're gonna be talking about and things like that and understanding it from a quantitative sense. This is a book that I would recommend by Russell Blaylock. Okay, it's excitotoxins, the taste that kill. He goes into monosodium glutamate and other excitotoxins that you can run into in the environment. Dr. Blaylock is a fantastic MD. Very, very early on uh, recognized the risks of aluminum in vaccines. He's now on my editorial board of science, public health policy and the law. I did go in 
to the history of toxicology a little bit here. This is not environmental toxicology, but who poisoned who, all right, and throughout history, toxicology in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And I'll be referencing some of those stories um, as we go. Um, environmental toxicology and chemistry, uh, Donald Crosby, another good technical reference if you're a chemist, especially, uh, and you feel that we biologists are just way too out there with our fuzzy, warm polar bears and things like that. You know, if you want to get, you want to cuddle up with uh, uh, an acetone molecule or some polycyclic, uh, you know, compound, go ahead and, and grab this book. This is by Donald Crosby. He did a really good job on that. Um, uh, this is a book I haven't read through, but Sustainability Principles and Practice. Yes, I'm going to get into the sustainability issue as we go, and we can talk about it and debate Margaret Robertson. Um, she, I invited her to Unbreaking Science and, uh, and to uh, teach a course here on sustainability, and she declined. She's got too much going on. Um, and this would be a type of a book that I would expect, an, an introduction to environmental toxicology, third edition. Um, pretty much this would be the type of book that I would you would expect to see at like Cornell University in their forestry program and so on. Um, so this would be like a higher level, maybe third year uh, environmental toxicology course textbook. Um, and then the mother of all beasts here, the fundamentals of to tox toxicologic pathology, right? The mechanisms of the actions of toxins. Right, so I have all this reference material. I haven't read it. I'd like to say I read this whole thing and that I can just, you know, tell you exactly, answer all of your questions, but don't be afraid to ask questions. And I'm, I would hope as I go through and update all of my lectures that I include the mechanisms of action of toxicology if it's known for the toxins we're going to talk about. Um, and then regulation in the pub public interest. We all know that regulatory capture is pretty, mu pretty much complete by corporations in, in most Western countries. Uh, and the corporations don't even have to do it in other countries. Um, you know, the US dollar diplomacy is one and the same. I mean, I love America, but come on guys, let's, let's not kid ourselves. So I wouldn't be surprised as we go along, we talk about these kinds of things, how society structures itself in terms of regulating who's gonna govern who and who's gonna control what is put out there and put into our bodies and our water, our air, our food. Uh, if we don't get into the debate over or discussions, at least about the World Economic Forum and things that they're they're planning on and, and doing for our, our greater good. And that's all fair game. So I'm hoping to be able to you know learn from you as well and get your insights on it and resources and discussions and especially when it comes to liability and responsibility. I think that's that, that's that's very important. When I took my environmental uh, course as a biologist. You know, I was very, very, very impressed by the corporations that went into Africa, through South Africa, and took out all the resources from the developing nations. And I wrote an essay um, where my at the the essay that I wrote for the class, or the writing assignment, was pick a pick a topic uh, that's of national or inter, international interest and write about it. And I decided to predict, based on what I could see happening, that. Um, regionalization was going to happen. I predicted the European Union before anyone talked about it. Uh, because, you know, NAFTA was just around the corner. Okay, it was 1980 something, 1988, I think, when I took this class. And I predicted that the African nations would, you know, get their act together, either, you know, and form an economic block. It was all about economic blocking. Uh, kick the Westerners out and take over their natural resources. And he handed me back my essay and he gave me a B minus. And he said, I'm not giving you a B minus because you said did your analysis was wrong. I'm giving you a B minus because I disagree with you. And he said that, you know, the power of the money coming from dollar diplomacy at the time is just going to continue to grow and, and, and grow and grow. And so there's no way you're talking about, you're talking about the, the omegas on the, on the food chain uh, of economics, getting get, getting their act together and being able to form an economic bloc that has any power um, for their for their own interests, for their peoples and their countries and so on. And it was a valuable lesson, right? So I gave my opinion. And the way that he said it was, do you think this is really gonna happen? Do you really think this is gonna, it's, it's, it can, can happen? And so he did me a favor in saying, listen, buddy, there's gonna be people out there that disagree with you and they're gonna give you a hard time about your opinion. This is an opinion piece, your analysis included way too much opinion about what you thought was going to happen. 
So what happened was I got a B minus for the paper that predicted the European Union. I'm sorry, you know, the economic, the regionalization, right? And, and so uh, as a history student, uh, a lover of history, a lifelong student of history, understanding the development of society, where it's come from, you're right, uh, people falling out of trees, discovering that they can walk, right? Learning how to hunt, freeing up their hands, the brain then can grow. I mean, the evolution of our species forming tribes uh, you know, from the family to the tribe as survivorship increased and the population grew to the villages. We're talking about, we've, we've been on the planet for 4.8 4 million years as upright hominid species, a lineage at least. Um, there've been a lot of trials and tribulations. There's been a lot of experiments and our cultural awareness, our current cultural awareness of who we are and what's, what's behind us and what's happened is minuscule. We're just this this very fragile thread of humanity racing through time at the speed of life. Um, and we really have no idea about what's worked in the past and what hasn't at all different scales. So I think it's fair enough to have debates and discuss. I think it's important to have debates and discuss the nature of our own reality. I think it's imperative on every person on the planet. I'm soapboxing now and I'll try not to do that too much, but every person on the planet should be involved in the construction of their own society in every generation. It doesn't mean we need a revolution. It doesn't mean the problems aren't solved and we can rely on certain problems, but we have to participate in our own governance. We have to participate and have our say heard. Uh, and when we do this, we can affect change. There's no doubt about it. So uh, I disagree with my environmental science professor. I think that it is possible. I still think that the African countries could kick the Western Westerners out. Uh, but first, the people of the Western countries have to kick the corrupt people out that are, you know, selling them out. So that, that's where we're at with that. So that's my intro for the course uh, and what's the, the resources behind it, why I'm teaching it, and what I hope to accomplish uh, is, is coming next. So this is an overview of, of everything that we're, we hope to get through uh, when, when, when we review the material in this class and the lectures. So. Um, I'm going to stop the share because I, I have to, uh, there's a video on here that I have to optimize for. So this will work at the very end. Environmental toxicology, ecosystem and human health, the course overview. So obviously simple questions, what is environmental toxicology and what is ecosystem health? What is human health? Uh, what will be covered this semester, and what is environmental toxicology B? So environmental toxicology is a collection of challenges. It's a collection of sources of issues and their solutions. I don't want to just co constantly complain about the toxins that corporations are putting into their environment, but, but that message is huge. What I want to do is I want to put some meat on the bones of the general public's uh, understanding that Something is very, very wrong with the way that we're running our society. Even though there's regulation and regulatory captures happen, what can we, what can we attack? Uh, how, what can we push back on? And, and where are we going to be able to make the, the most change? Uh, taking a historical look at this, this is really about resource use. So from a Western heritage perspective, because we live in a Western country, mankind has been thought for the past 3,000 years or so to have dominion over nature. That's been the primary mode of the, the Christian view. I'm not picking on Christians, but that is fundamental to our culture. We control nature. We see it in our mowing of our lawns, the weeding of our lawns. We call things a weed simply because we don't want it there. In reality, it's a wildflower in other settings. Um, this particular culture brought about most of industrialization and these resources did have led to class struggles that we know about and have led to wars for limiting resources. Um, resources that are limited to one country, access to waterways, access to water, <laughs> right? So um, we went through World War II for various reasons, but let's not be on the scope of this course. Um, and we learned in World War II that resources are very limited in a, in a booming industry with industrialization and making all of the cars uh, after World War II, uh, the mass production of tanks, uh, planes, other vehicles, weaponry, taught us that we can put a machine to work and put people attached to the machine to work 
and do mass production, which led to mass consumption of resources from the Earth's crust. We've discovered which resources are truly limiting in terms of being able to do things, right? Like right now, we, the, the, the resources that go into the batteries in your phone are extremely limiting to the pr production rate of, of uh, new, new telephones. Uh, we've uh, attempted recycling as a way to reduce the, uh, you know, to reuse uh, resources that are already extracted from the Earth's crust so that we don't have to go through that energy cycle again. Um, and we can use less energy by recycling certain, you know, raw materials. But post-World War II, we've gone through some phases of, in the 1970s, an awakening of, you know, tree huggers and environmentalism, the idea that we all live downstream, the idea that lakes were dying due to the toxins from the chemicals that were being dumped in, such as, you know, Lake, Lake, Lake Erie, uh, especially in the Great Lakes uh, in North America. This environmental awareness led to a cohort of professors that decided that they should teach conservation, conservation biology. That wasn't enough. It was learned that we should probably teach sustainability and learn the value of ecosystem services, such as the ability of wetlands to actually pull heavy metals out of water and, and filter water and make water uh, you know, suitable for uh, exposure to wildlife and for human consumption. And in the 2020s, what we're going to see, if you've not peeked around that particular corner, is something called smart growth. Uh, and, and a focus on an ecotoxicity and environmental toxicity should be part of smart growth. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of smart cities, but they're highly automated. Uh, there's a lot of money that is available to go into the development of smart cities. Um, you know, 5G is just the tip of the iceberg. And... Uh, radically altering the way that we live our lives, interact with each other, how we consume our consumption choices uh, are fairly automated. What we do with our time for employment, what we do with our time for leisure, all of these things are on the table for people who uh, believe that they have constructed a future for us that is uh, less, uh, consumes less energy and thereby based on their interest, uh, reduces the amount of CO2 output. And this and, 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 and would impact uh, global warming in their, in their model. So in, in this course, I'm not gonna go into climate change, uh, global warming as much as one might think. Whenever you think about e ecotoxicology or environmentalism, all you ever hear about is climate change for the most part. But there are dire threats that are being visited upon our bodies and, and our health, and thereby also on the bodies and health of animals in the environment and plants in the environment. PFOS is a good example. We're going to go into great detail on this, and I'm going to give you an introduction today just in this overview of per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. I'm sorry to read this to you, but this is what I want you to understand there are a group of man-made chemicals that include uh, PFOA, PFOS, Gen X, and many other industrial chemicals. They're surfactants. They've been manufactured and used for decades since the 1940s. They've most extensively produced uh, in developed countries, of course, and they've spread them around the world. So even if uh, PFOS is a uh, particular uh, floral surfactant is regulated in the United States, it's most likely still being exported to other countries. Um, floral surfactants are synthetic organofluorine chemical compounds. Uh, they have multiple fluorine atoms attached to an alkyl chain on the molecule. According to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, there are at least 4,700 different PFOSs with at least three perfluorinated carbons. The US Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA Toxicity Database, DSS Tox, lists 8,163 PFOSs. A subgroup of these, the fluoral surfactants or fluorinated surfactants have a fluorinated tail, a hydrophilic head, and are, are, that, that's how they're useful. This was the map I wanted to share with you. Uh, when we they, they're starting to survey contamination in drinking water uh, and wells around the country. And this is a map that fairly well maps to drinking water supplies. Um, the, the, the contamination of these forever chemicals uh, are 
well, it's it's thorough and extensive in the United States. Um, the messaging over forever chemicals like PFAS and uh, their effects, uh, you know, to minimize the public's concern over this, the uh, governor of Pennsylvania this year in 2021 reported that while a third of all the wells tested in Pennsylvania tested positive for PFAS contamination, meaning that the people using those wells and drawing from those water resources have chronic exposure, that there's not a grave concern because it's not ubiquitous. It's not 100%. So apparent, according to the governor of Pennsylvania, we don't need to be concerned about PFAS contamination until 100% of our water supplies are contaminated. Um, that's an odd message. Often in environmental toxicology, a problem arises because the reporting organisms, so to speak, are humans that develop cancers in clusters or other conditions in clusters. Now, there's a ongoing surveillance for cancer clusters. Um, I'm aware of that. I don't think there's an ongoing surveillance for things like Parkinson's disease clusters. There should be. Public health should be all over this, but I don't believe that there's an ongoing, even though we have all the ability to do this, just download, you know, databases, um, electronic medical records, and you can find all the clusters. It's almost as though this information would be too disruptive to processes. The articles here, they, these, these talk about girls that came down with brain cancers uh, in a cluster. Uh, this one is six, fixed, six fict victims in Palm Beach, County in Florida that all developed um, uh, br brain cancers at a very young age uh, of a, a, the type of brain tumor that is often only occurs in older people. And um, the proximity to the um, defense contractor Pratt and Whitney was, was, was quite evident. And it turned out that there was radiation leakage from Pratt and Whitney into, um, into the neighborhood, into the water supply. So environmental toxicology, let's focus on what this is in general. Well, here we can look at it from an epidemiologic perspective, do some mapping, find the hot spots, address the, the sources of toxins and reduce the, the, the exposure, right? But I want to identify environmental to 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 toxicity um, as anything that moves the relationship between humans and the environment from balance, homeostasis with nature and with our, our own ability to be healthy to imbalance. So the internal nature of the human species, we as a people, yourself, your family, there is a continuum between you and the rest of the world. We, our, our, our psyche, or the way that we're socialized, our culture tells us that we are independent individuals. But in reality, there's a continuum of physicality. If you think about it for a moment, it's kind of amazing that you can sit down and eat anything off of a plate and then our bodies transform that food into human tissue, right? That's kind of amazing. So there's a continuum in the things that we eat, things that we drink, the air that we breathe. Uh, and I don't think of environmental tox toxicology or toxicity as a warm and fuzzy kind of balance. The homeostasis is a scientific one. It's a uh, it's economics. I think about it in terms of economics, right? How could we get the, the largest amount of healthy food into, you know, the, the, the least nourished people with the least cost? This would, you know, and, 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 and if we're going to do that, and if I'm in charge of that program, there's no toxins in the food, right? So how do we do that? Then there's costs involved. And what are the benefits? The benefits are, you know, less expenses in terms of the cost to those people's poor health or, you know, poor neurodevelopment and their poor immunologic development. It's really about design science and, and thinking about efficient distribution systems. Uh, it, it's waste minimization, right? We certainly don't, we, in our culture, at least we're taught by our parents that, that waste is, is uh, not a good thing, right? Um, and, and it's about energy recapture. It's about material recapture. It's, it's whole scale change in trajectories of economies and societies. And it's about health and a people, a, a planet and its people. It's about the health of a planet and its people. 
And it's not necessarily about abundance. It's about understanding what is enough, right? And, and this, why is dealing with abundance? And, and what do we do with excess? We need to start thinking about this in terms of complex systems. But first and foremost, this has to be done with respect for culture. We can't, it won't succeed if we try to impose a new system on people. Not only do we have to get a buy-in, which could be done through propaganda, it could be done through manipulating people's minds and understandings uh, in, a, in, a, in a subterfuge manner. I think it really just takes an understanding of, of you know, personal responsibility to yourself extends to your immediate surroundings, extends to your immediate community, because the better you take care of the things that are taking care of you, that you interact with, the better you are. There's a selfish motive for not wanting to, you know, pollute your water. And, and this, I think, should be sufficient. Historically, it hasn't been. And I think it's because there has been a haughtiness in the message of, of environmentalism. And if we start thinking about this as design science, then we can perhaps come to an understanding that our responsibility to the seventh generation tells us to slow down. So our, our understanding of these problems can be split into acute and chronic, right? So acute disasters, the worst environmental disasters and human made environmental disasters in history of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. If we're mindful of the fact that this was a decision made by, my, by a minority of people for national reasons, not international reasons, not certainly not thinking about the environmental health uh, uh, or the toxicity of what they were using, but rather, you know, get the job done. This was the, arguably the worst uh, acute environmental disaster in terms of the human death toll and in terms of the loss of animal life and toxicity in the environment and so on. Um, <clears throat> just the devastation, the sheer devastation obliteration, right? But there have been others that have been acute. The nuclear accident at, at Three Mile Island, I mean, the hubris of people who promote nuclear power, my position on it is that if you're going to create something that's going to make an environment toxic for the next 50,000 years, you better know what you're doing. And of course, Chernobyl is another example where we thought we knew what we were doing. And the hubris of the people who were on site who refused to go look at the reactor because they knew that it couldn't possibly be as described by their colleagues. The arrogance, right? And look at Chernobyl now, uninhabitable for the foreseeable future for many, many, many generations. <laughs> there are, uh, you know, explosions from time to time like this one. I believe this is Bhopal, India, with, oh, right, with the... Uh, uh, chlorine gas that, that maimed and killed thousands. Um, the oil spills are another example of acute uh, toxicity problems. They have long lasting impacts on the environment, but uh, nature is resilient that way. Uh, I'm not an apologist for oil spills by any means. I think that we should dispense with oil consumption uh, as much as possible. Uh, the largest oil spills affecting U.S. waters shown here include Deepwater Horizon of 2010, which you all probably remember. But there have been many, many others, but that's not the largest in the world. When we, I think the largest in the world was in South America and Brazil. So if, if we look at these generally recognized man-made environmental disasters, if acute and chronic, and what are their differences, we can see that the Dust Bowl of the United States was caused by humans deciding that they were going to farm in a particular climate region with techniques that worked in the Northeast of the United States, but were not really suitable for wide open spaces. Um, the great smog events, I mean, the, the great smog was acute uh, and Minamata Japan with the mercury contamination of, of, of the fish by dumping of uh, mercury, uh, methyl mercury, into the water by a corporation with the knowledge of the Japanese government at the time, Bhopal, India. These are acute. Now, 
what do they have in common that's different from the rest of say, and this is a gradient, Kuwait, uh, the BP oil spill, glyphosate, mercury, and aluminum exposure, chlorpyrifos, um, a, a pesticide that's just been banned in the United States, and ongoing expanding deforestation. What's the difference between the acute and the chronic? The difference between the acute and the chronic in each of those examples of acute versus chronic, people changed what they were doing. In the Dust Bowl, they changed their agricultural practices. In the Great Smog, we started filtering out and we decided to stop burning coal, right? We stopped burning coal without uh, processing at first. And st we started using low sulfur coal and uh, controlling the smoke. <clears throat> uh, Minamata, Japan, they just told people you can't eat that fish anymore and we don't know for how long. Uh, and so they started testing the fish for mercury and serving fish that tested low enough in mercury. And Bhopal, that was acute because it was an explosion and hopefully they put better safety, um, safety protections on the processing of chlorine. Uh, in, in Kuwait with the oil fields, we capped the oil fields. So all of these things, and man, if, if, if humans make a problem, it, it can be reversed by changing of our behavior as long as it's not, you know, nuclear meltdown, right? Uh, right? As long as it's not Fukushima. This is something that we can't control right now. We can't control Chern Chernobyl. It's out of our hands. We've gone too far on those things. Um, mercury and aluminum is questionable whether we're going to be able to reverse the effects uh, on the human population in a meaningful way for quite some time, but I think eventually we will. The, the effects of chlorpyrifos on the human population in terms of neurodevelopment is well established. We know that it, it contributes to autism. Um, if we stop producing it, that would be a good thing. Limiting its use is not necessarily enough. We really need to ban some things and grow up and say, we're done with this. But the, the, I think about this as a continuum of our, you know, the scale, right? The chronic problems are much graver in many ways than the acute problems. The acute problems have a massive psychological impact because of the number of people or the, 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 the scale in terms of the geographic area impacted. It's concentrated, right? It's a large number of people over a short period of time. But the, the chronic exposures over time are really devastating in a way that is the cost is is nearly immeasurable in comparison to the the acute, right? So <clears throat> this is a video of a victim. Uh, it's age restricted, um, but this is a video. Uh, it was a video <laughs> of uh, a person who it's apparently age restricted, and I'm not. Uh, I'm not plugged in here. So uh, let me get back to that screen. Uh, if you go to watch this video and I'll send the slide out, uh, you'll see that this individual has behavior, behaviors that are um, very similar to those of uh, autism, young child with autism, the hand flapping, the shaking, not making eye contact. And the, and the point there is, uh, we can see mercury poisoning in one form, but the question is, are we allowing ourselves to see mercury poisoning in this other form? The, the ongoing deforestation, for example, in Brazil over time uh, is absolutely devastating to the native flora, to the native fauna, and to the future economy of that great nation. Uh, they have a wonderful resource there. And uh, the decisions of the conservatives to expand economically and put that ahead of the uh, well-being, perhaps of the entire planet, given that you know rainforests contribute so much uh, in terms of oxygen output and so on. Now it's easy for me to say I'm in a Western country. I'm not a poor farmer in the western edge of you know the frontier in Brazil, where I'm trying to raise a family out of the dirt below my feet. It's easy for me to say, yeah, we'll allow the timber industry in Canada to continue to plant and harvest and plant and harvest, but perhaps we should save the rainforest for future generations. But, you know, there's a romanticism about this. So I, I try to think about it in terms of the economic benefit to Brazil. All the species that have gone extinct in the rainforest so far 
or that will go extinct are, are lost resources in many ways to that country. So with environmental toxicology, the challenges and sources of issues, what are the root causes? We've known for, it seems forever of that population growth, the human population, with Garrett Hardin's essay of the tragedy of the commons, that people will act selfishly and take more of a limited resource uh, than they need to capitalize and for their own well-being to grow. They want a buffer on their well on their personal well-being. Uh, that has been, uh, you know, that has led to the projections that there's going to be this population boom that leads to a collapse of civilization. Uh, and some people would say that those predictions haven't come true, that technological advances will allow us to keep up with it in terms of feeding people, the so-called green revolution, uh, making rice that has more protein in it through genetic recombination and so on. Uh, but it's still an open question of what is the carrying capacity of the planet? The carrying capacity of an ecosystem is, you know, the total amount of numbers of individuals of a given species that can be sustained. And it is a dynamic process. The planet will push back. The resources, the limitations will push back and there will be limits to population growth. Um, what is the actual, we're seeing a decline in population growth now. I think a lot of it's due to exposures to environmental toxins. So we may be self-regulating uh, that way to an extent. The expanding industrialization, I mean, it, all, it almost seems quaint to talk about expanding industrialization now, but it's definitely a problem. Uh, the, the entire world becoming industrialized, uh, is probably the greatest ecological disaster that ever happened. And it started with, you know, England and Europe and the United States. Um, the consumerist mentality, you know, of personal ownership. I'm not against personal ownership. I just moved myself. I own way too much stuff. We have so many backup things for the kitchen, I can't tell you. Well, of course, we don't buy them new, we buy them from resale shops. But the unsustainable consumption, not being aware of where the materials in the goods that you purchase or where your food comes from, not really being aware of the, its impact on the well being of the people who produce it and the policies of who's doing that production. Is your coffee full of pesticides and you don't know it? Is your coffee collected by people who were barely paid a living wage and you don't know it? Um, the, the, these are mental positions. These are mental states, right? So you buy something to make yourself feel better is not going to make you feel better. It's going to make you know that you have something and you might feel good about that for whatever reason. But in the end, whatever's not making you feel good about yourself is internal happiness being a, a choice. The, the unsustainable consumption is, by definition, our species, the way that we do business of producing and consuming, it by definition is unsustainable until there's other technological advances that you know lower the energy of activation of production. I just posted on the environmental toxicology hangout on Facebook, a video that perhaps we could replace plastics with the mycelium from fungi. Interesting thought. Um, the, 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 the real challenges of chronic low dose exposure are much more compelling to me and much more worrisome than the acute disasters that we see from time to time. Uh, limited liability of the producers of pollutants and toxins and the patterns of production. The, the, this limited liability is, is inherent to gaming the system so that the little guy doesn't really have a voice in how things go. Uh, regulatory capture, the, the fact that the EPA is now moving against chlorpyrifos is just astounding. I was shocked to see it, um, but it's not just you know, I'm not gonna go political here, liberals versus conservatives, but the EPA puts on one hat during one administration and puts on a very different hat during another. 
And so if you look at the source of regulatory capture, it comes from campaign financial contributions from corporations to political parties, which basically needs to end. Uh, last year, when I was thinking about putting this course together, I decided to do some market research and put out a very informal Facebook poll about which toxins, which specific toxins people are concerned about. So this is the IPAC um, Facebook you know, toxin poll. And then I ranked a number of responses in a single Facebook post. Um, and number one were the artificial dyes in foods. Number two were fragrances. Number three, aluminum. Now that aluminum might be present because my particular social network is going to know about aluminum because I talk about it all the time. Artificial sweeteners came next, genetically modified organisms in close uh, behind that. Uh, detergents, canola, presumably because of glyphosate and canola, chlorine and chlorides, mercury, pharmaceuticals, sunscreens, Teflon, artificial flavors again, well, that's flavors, not dyes. Uh, BPA, uh, creganin, um, corn, again, for the pesticides, cosmetics, fluoride, herbicides, mainstream media came in ranking, uh, okay. Uh, MSG, parabens, pesticides, and the rest of the list here, I'll share the slides, you can look at it, it's fairly interesting. Um, I, I took this poll and I was heartened by it because of the awareness, the diversity of the awareness, how many different things. Now you didn't have to list just one. What they did, I, I think I asked them to list the top three. So th these are multiple responses, but the number of total responses that came in, artificial dyes, people are aware of that, probably because it's something that they can control. We really don't know, you know the individual cancer risk, but I'm not gonna feed that artificial dye, red dye number 40 or whatever to my son, right? That kind of thinking, but it's something that they're aware of. Um, I, I, I did a second poll of the top, the very, very top uh, few here, I guess the top 10, no, more than 10 there, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, maybe 16 or so. And, and I asked of, of the top ranking, which of these, of the, of the top responses are you most concerned about? And aluminum came in first. Again, I, I think that shows the social bias due to my own research on aluminum toxicity. <clears throat> After that, we're genetically modified Organisms, herbicides, mercury, pharmaceuticals, fluoride, fragrances, Teflon, and PFOS, flame retardants, pesticides, uh, BPA, artificial dyes. So see the artificial dyes, then once people are, are told, here are a bunch of toxins, which ones are you most concerned about? Artificial dyes didn't come in first. Sunscreens, artificial sweeteners, followed by chlorine and chlorides, and then artificial flavors. So that was an interesting exercise. It gives you some perspective on at least how people are thinking about it, it right off the top of their head. And our first one they think about is what are they feeding their children? But then it's okay, what perfume do I wear? And then there's the vaccines. And then again, what do I feed my children? And then what do I feed my children? <laughs> and what do I clothe them in? And what are they surrounded by? The detergents, you know? And uh, so then it's like, okay, what, what's going on here? Uh, you know, gives a, a different view on it. So the ecosystem effects that, that we're going to talk about and get into some detail are, are, are the acidifications of lakes and oceans. A good example of this is Puget Sound. I mean, it's becoming so acidified that fish populations are dying. We're having massive die-offs of fish in the Puget Sound. Air pollution effects on, oh, I should say, of course, that the mercury poisoning uh, and the oil pollution in the, the Amazon River is probably the, the worst uh, example of, of water pollution that, that, that I can think of so with, with similar fish die-offs. Air pollution effects on plants uh, is another effect here. So, you know, we're interested in the Puget Sound mostly because of the fish population, but just plants, vehicle exhaust and fumes and smog are huge. And that's an actionable thing. We can personally take personal responsibility and take control of the regulation of smog in our in our society, in our town, in our city, in our village, in our school district, because nobody else is doing it. The vehicle exhaust fumes the, the, at the local level can be controlled, but it's not being done. There's federal regulations, but the, the local regulations can be, can be uh, and, uh, as an example of this, I, when my sons were in, in grade school, I, I started a, a movement uh, to force the 
buses not to idle while they're at the school. Because I went there and I could see that all these kids were walking through these plumes of diesel uh, exhaust every day. Every day they went to school, they got a dose of diesel exhaust. And it sailed through and you know the uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, legislature just said, yeah, that's a great idea, let's not do that. So they, they, they prevented that. Now, the side effect of that was that there was more, there were more snow days <laughs> that had to be added to the schedule because on very cold days, you know, the buses, they had to idle or their fuels, their fuel would uh, freeze. So any day that the, the temperature went down below a certain temperature, they wouldn't run the buses because they knew the fuel would freeze, but they couldn't idle. So this, the kids got more days off from school. Um, effects of herbicides and pesticides on soil, not just in our gardens, but the mycorrhizome, the effects on the forests, the effects on, on all of the ecosystem, uh, largely unknown. Uh, there are dying forests in North America. So I think it's a valid question is the agriculture belt actually a source of uh, water for the, for the rain, so for the water cycle. Are we raining pesticides down on our forests? And what, what's my primary concern is the soil health there. Not necessarily the death of individuals, the low, very low chronic dose. What's, that, what's happening to the mycorrhizae there? That would be a very good research project for IPAC to do, is to, is to look at the effects of, of uh, pesticides, go to measure the pesticides in the soil of the, of the dying forests do some transect studies, do some plot studies, actually introduce things like glyphosate to different transects and plots. And I'm in talks with uh, Stephanie Seneff about potentially doing that study at IPAC to see if it's not just salinization that's causing the problem in the Chesapeake Bay dying forest, but perhaps there's pesticides from the agricultural belt. Um, effects of water pollution on native species. We see cancers in fish. In the Olentangy River in Ohio, for instance, uh, when I lived there, uh, when I was a young graduate student at the Ohio State University, um, the locals could only eat one fish per year of, of the Olentangy River. Uh, the death of the phytoplankton disrupts the food web, right? Uh, the addition of fertilizers creates algal blooms. There's reproductive toxins that we're going to talk about, the endocrine disruptors. The, the, those were first understood best through the effects of amphibians and uh, the, the gender influences, uh, not the uh, cultural gender, but the actual biological gender influences on amphibians. Um, acid mine drainage and oil spills, all of these are very important uh, ecosystem effects to keep in when you're thinking about ecotoxicity. Um, invasive species, moving species around. Right, the spotted lanternfly in northeastern North America is now the most recent biggest threat to, you know, the forests. Um, they, it's from Asia and it's in Pennsylvania. It's spreading to New York and it uh, feeds on the sap of trees, and then it it eats so much of the sap that its waste is its excrement is actually very rich and sweet. The bees pick it up, and now there's a thing called spotted lanternfly honey. Um, interesting. Uh, but, you know, they, they basically decimate forests, including agricultural forests. Um, so, yeah, the U.S. government's basically told if you, if you, everybody, if you see a spotted lanternfly, squish it. Uh, we can see the species extinctions have gone through the roof. They're just running out of space. The space is something that we're polluting with ourselves. We're, we're overpopulating areas where people, animals need large tracts of land and they need large continuous tracts of land to be able to sustain a viable population. The radiation effects through the chronic uh, exposure of the explosions that have taken place, um, but also just ambient radiation from, you know, the waste, the, the uranium waste, for instance, in, in Kuwait and in Iraq, uh, absolutely ecological disaster, what's happening to the animals and plants in those, in those areas. And then we'll drill down into specific toxins like DDTs and PCBs. <clears throat> so when we're when we're talking about um, you know living downstream, this is a good example here where you know there is no such places downstream. If you're running, if you're a ma master of industry and you're putting sulfur into the air, and you acidify the lake or the ocean, then you're going to have a problem with that part of your life. It is part of your life. So that lake and the ocean is part of your life. 
So the, the people that work there, the people that benefit from what's being produced in those fa factories, from our homes and so on, um, you know, the, the, the sulfur production led to mass lake acidification throughout the Adirondacks in northeastern North America until they moved to low sulfur coal. So what is ecosystem health? Well, ecosystem health, again, would be more, uh, instead of being out of balance, being in balance as producers and as consumers and thinking, constantly keeping in our mind the food chains, not just the food supplies, but food chains, the, with, you know, the warnings of bioaccumulation of toxins. So the little guys eat the intermediate guys, the intermediate guys eat, are eaten by the big guys and then we eat the big guys and then we get cancer. But what about the big guys themselves? Well, what's happening to their populations before we eat them, right? Shifting species ranges. I mean, my, my son is was an avid fisherman until he realized that all the bass anglers uh, called all these other beautiful fish throughout North America junk fish because they weren't bass, right? So they would bring in bass into an ecosystem just to have bass for the fun of it without any regard whatsoever for the other fish populations for sport, right? So we're moving species distributions around through in, in ballast water of major ships, uh, invasive species, invasive mollusks in the Great Lakes are, are a great threat. Uh, filter feeders, uh, a great threat to, uh, and, and other fishes, other types of fishes uh, that can come in. Uh, changing soil chemistry and water chemistry um, through what we're doing to the environment on mass and so we actually see species changing their own ranges instead of us just moving them around and introducing species and overall general habitat degradation it is not hard to to help nature have a vibrant habitat for animals and plants it is not difficult first step one is to leave it alone step two is to then if you have to disturb it, disturb it in a way that's going to enhance species diversity and you know, build communities around the habitat and the community becomes part of the habitat. Like in your backyard, you could just decide that you're going to just have local species, uh, native species. And I've seen this in many, many states, including Arizona. It's, it's quite beautiful to see desert plants growing in Arizona um, front and backyard without uh, a plot of grass that has to be watered every day just so you can mow it, right? It, it's quite beautiful. And then of course, for the effects of PFAS and these other contaminants in the water supply, the, the water supply is a reflection of what's happening in the watershed. So if PFAS is in the water supply, then PFAS is in the watershed. If PFAS is in the watershed, if these forever chemicals are in the watershed, they're affecting all the species that we know that consume water and that includes every species on the planet. <clears throat> so this was the story that I mentioned earlier that PFAS forever chemicals were detected in a third of the Pennsylvania uh, water tests. Um, so if we think about these different kinds of toxins that are out there in the environment and we think about human health from the ozone, that uh, local o high, high level of the ozone from, from, from traffic, um, uh, sulfur dioxide from industry, nitrogen dioxide, particulate matters. And we're going to go into great details on particulate matters and their role in air pollution next lecture. PCBs uh, in our light fixtures for decades and decades, dioxins, pesticides, endocrine disruptors, plastics, and um, heavy metal and radiation. When we think about it from a human perspective. It should be abundantly clear that the exact same biological processes that a fish needs to be a fish are present in our own systems. And so these toxins affect other organisms and species as well. And our own health is a measure of the health of the species around us. It's, you can pretty well guarantee that. And the same goes for plants. They have biological processes, DNA replication, DNA repair, mitochondria. They, they, they undergo cellular division, right? They, they have hormonal systems. Uh, it is very important to understand that it doesn't just start and stop with us. I did want to take a moment and go over this idea of developmental origins of health and disease, the do-head hypothesis. This is very important because in terms of 
understanding the toxicity of environmental of, of compounds and chemicals in the environment, we have to understand a, a particular reality and that some people can tolerate more toxins than others through genetic luck, really, but also through their uh, nutrition, through their own wealth and the wealth of their neighborhood and their, their country, you know, their society. Um, in this paper, International Health 2028, they produced this Developmental Origins of Health and Disease, the DUHAD hypothesis. And I'm going to go through it in detail so you can understand. The, the DUHAD hypothesis is a rather more recent term for the co concept initially proposed and called fetal origins of adult disease in the 1990s. And it postulates that exposure to certain environmental influences during critical periods of development and growth may have significant consequences on an individual's short and long-term health. This is part and parcel of the reason for my concern over chronic exposure, low dose chronic exposure, right? In this concept, the developing fetus, if exposed to a hostile uterine environment caused by insults such as poor nutrition, infections, chemicals, and I presume chemicals include things like aluminum and mercury from vaccines, metabolite or hormonal perturbations, responds by developing adaptations, which are predictive adaptive responses that not only foster its immediate viability, but also its survival if a similar environment is encountered later in life. In other words, they can become sensitized to these signals. Some examples of short-term adaptations of the fetus may make uh, in these scenarios, in these uh, uh, scenarios include downregulation of endocrine or metabolic function, and or specific organ function to slow down its growth rate to match the nutrient supply in the deprived uterine environment. We're talking about low income uh, individuals primarily, but this is true for the entire population. Long-term subtle irreversible changes in the development structure and function of some tissues and vital organs, such as the thymus, the skeletal muscles, uh, lung, Pancreas and kidney may occur as a result of disruption in gene expression, cell differentiation, and proliferation. However, if the individual then grows up in an extra uterine, uterine environment, the reverse of that experienced in, in, in utero, the mismatch and poorer fit therefore would predispose them to a higher risk of certain non-communicable diseases. The risk is further exacerbated by excessive weight gain in postnatal adult life and by the aging process itself, which tells us that under the Duhad hypothesis, the adult exposure is nowhere near as important as the in uterine and early childhood exposures. Okay, for everyone. So the topics for this semester, the way I've structured the course include categories of toxins. We're gonna to go through teratogens, mutagens, carcinogens, reproductive toxins, neurotoxins, excitotoxins, nutriotoxins, and immunotoxins. And if you can think of another category, let me know. If I let it, let it, left anything out, I'll look into it. We're going to have a developmental biology overview because it's just so important to understand um, the markers, the, the hallmarks of proper uh, developmental biology. I'm going to introduce you to the concepts of toxicity. This is where it's going to get a little quantitative, but we're going to really focus on the, you know, more detail, more granular view of acute versus chronic exposure, dose toxicity. LD50, how you measure if an organism, uh, if, if a toxin is in fact toxic. Uh, we're going to look at the pharmacokinet pharmacokinetics of serum and plasma soluble pollutants, and we're going to consider whole body toxicity. We're going to get into the arguments of evidence and causality. All right, so you should be well prepared at the end of this course to be able to engage in these discussions in other settings. Causality, direct causality, indirect causality, synergistic causality. Hill's criteria for causality, levels of evidence and scientific studies, which you've seen before in other classes, if you have them with me, association, dosage response, and reversibility are key markers of evidence for causality. Then we're going to focus on air pollution, water pollution, food pollution, and toxins in the home, school, and workplace, including mold, electromagnetic frequencies, uh, polyvinyl chlorides, especially. Uh, given their uh, potential contribution to pediatric cancers and PCBs. The way the course is structured, if you look at the syllabus, we're going to go through the general categories, air pollution, water pollution, food pollution first. And then we're going to go into the, develop the concept of toxicity, 
then we're going to get into uh, evidence of causality, and then uh, then we're going to drill into the categories of toxins. So the the course knowledge structure, if you will, is cumulative. The things that you learn early on, you'll be able to apply, and I would expect you to apply, and hope that you would apply it to your understanding of specific categories or or specific individual toxins, right? So that that's how I'm going to structure those. Um, Carcinogens, immunogens, clastogens, hallmarks of cancer, teratogens, developmental neurotoxicity, or certain neurotoxicology, the reproductive toxins, ethylene oxide and lead, uh, hormone mimics. We're going to talk about nutriotoxins, uh, obesogens, things that, that cause this metabolic disorder, heavy metals, flame retardants, pesticides and herbicides, microplastics, and pharmaceutical toxins. So there's two passes over this information. One is in the general sense. Right. So um, the air pollution, water pollution, food pollution, and then the kind of the introduce to you the categories of toxins and then the other, you know, concepts of toxicity, evidence of causality, but then the category of toxins. And then we're going to go into detail into these categories of toxins. That's what's on the menu for the course. Now, what's environmental B? I promised you I would explain this is environmental toxicology, um, uh, ecotoxicology A. What is ecotoxicology B? As you take this course, I would encourage you to zero in on one or two areas that concern you or interest you the most because I will offer, if there's enough interest among the class, environmental toxicology B or ecotoxicology B will have students of pairs of students prepare presentations on the topics that matter to most to them. Because I wanna give you guys the opportunity to communicate to groups. This is really important in this topic. If I sit here and I lecture and it's one way, even if we have group discussions, it's very different than you being responsible for organizing. And you know, when I put that course together, we can talk about how the best, best way to structure it. Is it you review two or three articles on the same topic and discuss it in general? Uh, you're talking about where regulation is. So are we gonna go into just understanding right now, say in the United States or Canada or wherever you live, exactly what the regulatory status is for a particular type of toxin. I mean, it's very generally defined as an exercise of you presenting something in this uh, ecotoxicology area that's of interest to you. Uh, so it's really an experience that, that you'll be participating in of producing you know, a, a coherent presentation and practice speaking in this public forum, right? So I have some recommended first reads they include this annual review from 2005 by Bruce Lanfear. He's, you're going to hear about Bruce a lot in this class. He actually reviewed the, uh, the syllabus a little bit and added, add, but gave me a suggestion of some things to emphasize and to, to add. Um, but by Rashid et al., I would read environmental related contaminants of high concern, potential sources and analytic modalities for detection, quantification, and treatment. Uh, Bruce's uh, um, review on the impact of toxins on the developing brain is outstanding. And then um, Landrigan et al., Human Health and Ocean Pollution is a good, is a good first read on uh, uh, very recently written on, on ocean pollution. And these are the list of books, the references that I went through and I showed you each of them and some of the additional texts. I don't have these, but these are recommended by Dr. Landfear. So basic environmental toxicology, I put the bookshop.org links for all of these. These are, according to him, um, very good references. There's a gaggle of online references so the NIEH library can look at. I signed up for Chemical Watch. Uh, this is uh, an organization that tries to help industry stay ahead of regulators. So it's really interesting to see those emails. Um, some links to look at, seven deadly disasters on history.com. There's a resource, a couple of resources here. Uh, Earth Watch, uh, uh, Earth Justice. These are organizations that you're going to see things from. Great Lakes Alliance, I'm gonna to post to you from, uh, just a couple of links here. There's a 77 page thing from the National Academy of Sciences I sent you by email. Uh, just a massive map. People are very concerned and worked in the decades prior to this one. To, to educate the world about this. So um, there's a, a good resource on mutagens, teratogens, carcinogens, and other resources. So there's, I'm gonna be 
carpet bombing you, sorry for the analogy, but carpet bombing you with a lot of things that you can look at and um, any that interests you that you want to drill down on. And this is, uh, we're going to close the, the lecture today with a, a, a video uh, by Bruce Landfair. It's called Little Things Matter. I want you to visit his site, littlethingsmatter.ca, and I would encourage you to sign up to get emails from him about the things that they're doing there. He has a team of graduate level, you know, um, I would say masters and probably PhD uh, and environmental toxicologists working on him, working with him to identify, you know, not only the most toxic compounds that are out there, the ones that we should be most worried about, the, but, the, but the ones that we can actually take take action against and have an influence on. And I can already see that there, that, that strategy is having a major effect um, with the banning of chlorpropyros. So we're gonna watch Little Things Matter. This is a very, very compelling video. I encourage you to share this across social media. It's true, not all chemicals are bad. But toxic metals, like lead and mercury, are found in all of us. So are persistent toxins, like PCBs, and endocrine disruptors, such as bisphenol A and flame retardants. We've been studying the impact of toxins on children for the past 30 years and reached the inescapable conclusion, little things matter. Toxins can have a lifelong impact on children. We've also discovered that extremely low levels of toxins can impact brain development. Let's take a look at the percent of children who are exposed to some of these toxins using a national study in the United States. To keep it simple, we'll use 100 children to represent all children. Mercury is found in 89% of children, primarily from eating large fish contaminated by pollution. Lead is detected in the blood of all children, regardless of race, income, or where they live. Over 80% of children are exposed to organophosphate pesticides, mostly from food. All children are exposed to PCBs, a persistent pollutant that was banned in the 70s, but will linger for generations. Bisphenol A, or BPA, is found in 96% of children. PBDEs, a type of flame retardant, are found in 100% of children. But these toxins don't occur in isolation. Children are exposed to many toxins and dozens of untested chemicals all the time. Let's take a look at the body burden of a typical child, one toxin at a time. If each marble represents one part per billion of a toxin, this figure represents the body burden of a typical child. One part per billion is deceptively small. It is only about two tablespoons of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. But chemicals can be biologically active, even at very low levels. The chemical industry has tried to assure us that concentrations of these toxins are too small to cause harm. But chemicals designed by drug companies to alter behavior, like the prescribed dose of Ritalin, a drug commonly used to treat children with ADHD, is active at levels about the same or even lower than toxins found in the blood. Besides, a lot of studies have shown that some chemicals can be toxic, even at very low levels. As the body burden of PBDEs in pregnant women increases, the intellectual ability of their children decreases. Let's take a closer look. As the level of PBDEs in mother's blood increases from 10 to 100 parts per billion, the IQ scores of their children drop by about five points. We see a similar pattern with organophosphate pesticides. As the level of organophosphate pesticides in pregnant women increases from 10 to 75 parts per billion, the IQ scores of their children drop by about five points. In the 1960s, hundreds of children died from severe lead poisoning every summer. Since then, much lower levels of exposure have been shown to result in learning deficits and brain disorders like ADHD. In fact, the World Health Organization and other agencies agree there is no safe level of lead exposure. As the level of lead in children's blood increases from zero to 100 parts per billion, IQ scores drop by about six points. In contrast, an increase from 100 to 200 parts per billion results in an IQ drop of two more points. An increase from 200 to 300 parts per billion results in an IQ drop of another point. The impact of toxins on the developing brain is permanent. Children who are more heavily exposed to toxins won't reach the same peak cognitive ability as those who have lower exposures. These studies show that there is no safe level of exposure. 
They also indicate that the way we regulate toxins, which assumes there is a safe level, fails to protect children. The chemical industry argues that the effect of toxins on children is subtle and of little consequence. But that's misleading. Little shifts in children's IQ scores have a big impact on the number of children who are challenged or gifted. Let's go back to our original sample of 100 children and look at a typical distribution of IQ scores. Most of us have IQ scores that fall between 85 and 115 points. Only 2.5% of children have an IQ above 130, which is considered gifted. There are about 6 million children in this group. On the other end of the distribution, another 2.5% of children have an IQ below 70, which is considered challenged. The impact of exposure to a toxin like lead causes a 5-point drop in IQ. This shift results in a 57% increase in the number of children that are challenged, from 6 million to 9.4 million. There is a corresponding decrease in the number of children that are gifted, from 6 million to 2.4 million. Little shifts matter. The impact of exposure to another toxin, like flame retardants, results in a further increase in the number of children who are challenged, from 9.4 million to over 11 million. There is a further decrease in the number of gifted children. Although many, or even most, chemicals are harmless, the cumulative impact of exposures to three or four toxins is overwhelming to imagine. In Canada and the United States, chemicals are used in consumer products and released into the environment before they are tested for toxic effects. By allowing children to be exposed to toxins or chemicals of unknown toxicity, we are unwittingly using our children as part of a massive experiment. But it doesn't have to be this way. Like the European Union, we could require industry to prove that the chemicals they use aren't toxic before they enter the market. How can we avoid exposures to toxins or chemicals of unknown toxicity? The ultimate solution is to revise how we regulate chemicals. Consider writing a letter to your government representative and urge them to require industry to test their products before they are put on the market. There are a few simple ways you can reduce your child's exposure to toxins. Eat fresh or frozen foods. If possible, choose organic. Try to avoid canned foods and steer clear of heavily processed foods. If you are pregnant or planning to become pregnant, eat fish low in mercury. Don't use pesticides in and around your home. Check your home for lead hazards, especially if it was built before 1960. Frequent cleaning of floors and surfaces can help reduce children's exposures to lead, flame retardants, and other toxins in house dust. Okay, so we have Bruce Lamphere, <clears throat> Little Things Matter. He's got other videos that are equally compelling. Um, I, and I have to credit him and his team for really lighting a fire under me uh, to put this course together. So uh, we're going to learn about the particulate matter next time, I think, yeah, next time when we talk about air, air pollution. Um, and that's why, you know, sweeping and dusting a house quite often uh, is so very important and is pr probably worth having some kind of filtration system if you have a, a young one, a, a very small infant at home. Um, you know, beyond just a normal house filter uh, on, on, on a central air, you know, a, a central furnace or air conditioner. So um, yeah, so that's what the goals are for the course. We're, we're gonna see what we can do, uh, what we can learn together and, um, you know, I'm absolutely, uh, again, thrilled. If you think that this course is one of the most exciting courses that, that you have seen um, and one of the most important courses that you've seen, uh, please do try to help us get more people to enroll. And the more people that we can educate and empower with the facts on the ground and the more people that we can activate into action and motivate them to make this, I mean, I. I my goal in this class is that not only after every class, but after the class, every person that takes this class will forever in a day be a warrior against the toxins if you're not already. And, and uh, you don't have to be a warrior against the people that produce the toxins. You just have to be a warrior for educating them that they're poisoning us, they're poisoning the fish, the trees, 
uh, the water, animals, and uh, destroying our, our, our planet, of which, of course, we only have one. So with that, um, we'll stop the recording and I'll take questions.